The second Jack Olazarski music lecture at the basement here in Sydney. And firstly, I would like to acknowledge that we are here tonight on Gadigal land. Aboriginal land always was, always will be. I would also like to pay my respects to the elders past and present. Uh, I'm your MC for this evening. Uh, like last year, my name's Brendan Gallagher. I'm a long-time songwriter and performer and producer. I'm also an APRA ambassador and director and uh, an unreconstructed music fan, which is why I'm here tonight. So first up, some thank yous. Um, firstly, to APRA and COST for their support for tonight's event. Um, to the steering committee, my fellow members, Frankie Lee and uh, John Wardle from the live music office. Please give them a big clap. Also to Nathan Farrell and all the staff at the basement, um, our friends in the media who uh, got the word out, uh, to the, the Ozarski family as well, and also, of course, the band, Tina Harrod, Darren Percival, Vienna Sanzone, Dave Symes, Arnie Hannah, Hamish Stewart, Scott Leishman, Stu Hunter, Clayton Dolly, James Greening, Anthony Cable, and Matt Keegan. Okay, this is a very simple fair affair, informal. I do an intro, the lecturer comes out and gives his lecture. Afterwards, we announce the winner for the Jack Yorzarski composition contest, and then the band comes on. And this year it's going to be one long set because you're all a bit old and you need to get home and put your jammies on <laughs> as soon as possible. <laughs> so, what is the purpose of the Jackie Ozarski Music Lecture? Simply, it's to celebrate and perpetuate the legacy of the late Jackie Ozarski, whose impact on Australian music, while comprehensive, is not fully appreciated by music fans, though on a daily basis they are exposed to recordings and live performances that he may have directly influenced as a composer, an arranger, a performer, and a band leader. And secondly, it's to create an ongoing forum where a grown-up in Australian music can hold forth on contemporary issues in an atmosphere of passion, sophistication, and wisdom, we hope. Um, much like the man who lent his name, albeit posthumously, to the event. So if you want to come here and blow smoke rings up the date of the Australian music industry, this is the place. If you want to tip shit on the Australian music industry, this is the place. Whatever you want to do, that's what we want to make it. But it's got to be someone who's earned their stripes in the music biz, much like our first lecturer, Lucky Oceans, and tonight our second lecturer, John Shan. Okay, who was here last year? Okay, so I won't repeat my shtick from last year. You've heard it before. Um, but I will just briefly recap on Jack Yorzarski's life in music. Jack was a first call bass player for Trafal Trafalgar Studios and Uber producer Charles Fisher in the 70s and 80s, playing on countless records, Australian standards and sometimes covering for a young bassist in a young band struggling in a new and intim intimidating studio environment, much like George Young did with those early ACDC records. Um, he instigated the so-called University of Jackie Ozarski that fostered a generation of players who have contributed to the music of Missy Higgins, Cole Chisel, Cole Chisel, sorry, Boy and Bear, Sia, and many, many more. His Tuesday night long-running residency at the Rose of Australia in Erskineville was once described in the Sydney Morning Herald as the best night of free music anywhere in the Western world. If James Hetfield from Metallica was in town, where do I go for some good music? And he'd be told, go and see Jackie at the Rose, or Stevie Wonder's band. He was, he was world-renowned. Um, in 2006, he received Hungary's Knight's Cross of the Order of Merit for his contribu contribution to music and culture. It was conferred posthumously in 2008 when Tina and the band went to Budapest to receive it. Of course, Jackie hailed from Budapest, he toured here in 1970 with Sirius at the behest of Charles Fisher and he came back four years later and stayed joining the band Bakery. In the late 70s he became Marsha Hines' 
music director. And in the, in the 80s and onwards, he formed and performed, sorry, he formed many bands and performed all over Australia and Europe. Bands like Jump Back Jack, The Grey Suits, The Godmothers, The Grandmasters, The Leslians, The Budget Orchestra, Industrial Accident, Hungarian Rap Statists, Accidental Boyfriends, and I was told after last year's event that he played live with the Play School Band in Martin Place. Is that true? <laughs> Can I get an amen? Amen. Thank you very much. Um, he contributed horn and string arrangements to a cross-section of Australian artists over, over uh, several music generations. From people like Tim Finn, David Lane, You and I, Leonardo's Bride, Savage Garden, Grinspoon, and more. Um, drummer Hamish Stewart played with brother Jack more than a couple of times for nearly 30 years. And I'd, I'd like to, to quote uh, from Hamish who said, Jack was so special because he had a high level of commitment, talent, creativity and personality. He didn't suffer fools but was very generous with his time, knowledge and experience. He thought you were worthy of it. I think most musicians who were lucky enough to work with Jack for a period of time took away with them some enhanced vision of the fundamental concepts about playing and writing music that he was able to impart most of the time by example that is on the bandstand where you could experience these ideas night after night on the gig not in a classroom environment very wise words thank you brother Hamish Okay, so now, as advertised, let me introduce our 2017 Jackie Ozarski music lecturer. He's John Shand. He is a playwright, a librettist, an author, a journalist, a critic, and a drummer. And I learned recently that he got drum lessons um, from the late, great Robbie Souter. He has written about music and occasionally theatre for the Sydney Morning Herald for over 24 years. His books include Don't Shoot the Best Boy, The Film Crew at Work, The Australian Ac Accent, a book about Australian jazz, The Phantom of the Soap Opera, and John's new play Guilt will be performed by the Gina Theatre in Chicago in 2017. Oh, it says Chicago. Okay, I take it back. I even checked that with him. <laughs> okay, Washington, Chicago, you say Washington, I... okay. <laughs> he lives in Katoomba, I got that right? Yeah. Okay. With she who is called the, the mouse, or the moose. He enjoys wine and wishes he could say in moderation. John attended many Jackie Ozarski gigs over the years, occasionally as reviewer, but usually as a punter. He probably knows more about Jack's music than anyone outside the band and the family. And it was John who wrote, wrote Jack's obituary for the Sydney Morning Herald in February 2008. And I quote, More than anyone else, Jack Ozarski was the hub around which the many-spoke wheel of the Sydney music scene revolved. While the music itself was always his priority, he engendered a sense of community in making it. That a community of musicians could better serve the music and that the music innately served the needs of the wider community were central concepts to his philosophy. The beauty of the man shone through his music. Although singing was his favorite craft, he will be equally remembered for his profound bass lines, his multifaceted piccolo bass playing, and his brilliant songs, epitomized on the Family Law album. If his presentation was pleasantly eccentric and relaxed, <clears throat> there was always an intensity about the intent some marvel at the breadth, breadth of his endeavour, but to Ozarski, it was always music, all life rendered in sound. I can't think of anyone in the entire country who touched so many different musicians in so many different ways, and how true that is. Um, I'd not met John before tonight, but much like how the name of the late Mark Colvin was a byword for integrity in broadcasting journalism, I've always associated the name John Shand in print with sophistication, wisdom, and insight. And so here he is in living colour tonight, 
your 2017 Jackie Ozarski Music Lecturer, John Shan. Please give him a big Sydney welcome. set up my bar. Okay. I'm the support act. That's the sort you get when the headline is called the budget orchestra. <laughs> Apparently the best way to overcome nerves is to pretend you're just talking to one person. So if you can boo and heckle individually that might help me. As Brendan just said, my obituary for Jack concluded with some marvel at the breadth of his endeavour, but to Ozarski it was all music, all life rendered in sound. I believe these two ideas are interrelated, that all music is one, and that a deeper truth emerges when life is being expressed rather than notes merely being played. It is these ideas I want to explore tonight, perhaps with some scenic detours along the way. I began writing about music in 1991, and call me a slow learner, but it's only sometime this century that I started to understand what the job is really about. Being a judge of quality is not the main point, nor is being an historian, a musicologist, or an analyst. A few years ago, I was on a talk fest panel where someone declared that the only legitimate way to write about music was technically. I bit my tongue at the time. What I should have said, never so politely, was bollocks. To write about music in purely technical terms is to alienate most of the potential readership at a stroke. But nor is re responding emotionally enough. It's the critic trying to evoke what he or she heard in some purple haze that led to writing about music being amusingly likened to tap dancing about architecture. I prefer to think of this evocation aspect as akin to trying to paint ghosts. Take recording out of the equation and music remains the most magically ephemeral of the arts, especially when it includes improvisation. So other than taking everything on its own terms, and trying to grasp the artist's intent, what is the job really about? The answer is simple and applies to all arts. The role of the critic is to discern truth because the role of the artist is to play, paint, or write truth. Last year at this event, the esteemed Lucky Oceans now axed in an imbecilic move by the ABC, quoted Duke Ellington's statement that there are only two types of music, good and bad. Far be it from me to say that the Duke and Lucky are wrong. Well, not that far, because good and bad implies taste, and taste is transient. I prefer honest and dishonest. As Duke implied, no genres. Genres are a convenience rather than a reality. The album reviews I now rather intermittently write for Spectrum appear under genre headings. Sometimes I spend more time agonizing over these, trying to avoid putting an album into an ill-fitting and irrelevant box than I do writing the review. Music is music. Entirely coincidentally, I first understood this when I first began writing about the subject. 
The catalyst for both was the late great Lester Bowie, trumpeter, composer, band leader, and co-founder of the Art Ensemble of Chicago. Having come here with that band, Lester returned in 1981 with another magical group called From the Root to the Source. This included such towering musicians as Reggie Workman, the incandescent soul singer Fontella Bass, and her brother David Peaston, an even more stunning gospel singer. Being such a huge fan of Lester's work, I was curious to meet him, and the only way I could think to do that was to interview him. At the time, I'd never written about music. I'd written plays and song lyrics, I was an absurdly limited guitarist and a slightly less limited drummer. With From the Root to the Source playing several nights at the Capitol Theatre, I pitched an interview to the editor of Jazz Magazine, who rather took the wind out of my sails by saying he'd never heard of Lester Bowie. Given I have the selling skills of a slug, I suspect the fact that he said yes reflected a certain desperation for content. I somehow organized to meet Lester in his hotel room, and I took along my dear old friend, Rob Souter, who, as Brendan said, has so very recently died. He, of course, was a wonderful drummer with the dynamic hypnotic, Slim Dusty, the Pinks, and many, many more. I think I took Rob along, perhaps in case I was too starstruck to speak or something. In the event, Lester was charming, funny, and insightful. I think I heard from the root to the source four nights in a row and loved how it gently illustrated that all forms of African-American music are limbs of the same entity. It played material that could be described as gospel or blues, New Orleans jazz or bebop, Afro-Cuban, R&B, and free improvisation, not just from one song to the next, but sometimes from one bar to the next. I heard something truly glorious that was also espousing a profound truth. Lester and his collaborators weren't doing pastiches of these styles, they were living them. As well as the truth of it all being one, there was truth in the music itself. This was truth like you can hear across the gamut of music, from Nina Simone to Maria Callas, Ruby Hunter, Albert Isla, and the members of the Buena Vista Social Club. You can hear it in Charlie Hayden playing Song for Shay, or Ravi Shankar playing a night raga, in Patsy Cline singing Three Cigarettes in an Ashtray, Sam Cook singing A Change Is Gonna Come, or Jackie Orzarski singing Track To Mind. Like Lester, Nina, Goran Bragovich, Joseph Tawadros, Bill Frizzell, Joshua Bell, Robert Wyatt, Rai Kuda, Julian Kerwin, and others, Jack also understood that all music was one. His espousal of this was spectacularly broad, with the inevitable Bartok and Hungarian gypsy influences alongside all the African-American ones and others. Jack treasured diversity. Excuse me. His second Erskineville Music Festival in 2000, an event I'll never forget, included and this is quite broad, I reckon. Electra String Quartet, John Cleary, Australisis, Sylvia Entchiva, Tim Friedman, Apizu Bangura, Mike Knock Quartet, Jenny Marie Langband, and 50 Million Beers, among many, many others. That very diversity played its part in community building the thing that live music does better than any other art form as fans of Bulgarian folk music rub shoulders with fans of New Orleans funk and all the rest, whether over a beer or in a church. 
So how do we define this elusive trait in music called truth, and why is it so important? In saying this to a room bulging with exceptional musicians, I get an inkling of how the primary school teacher felt who taught Albert Einstein arithmetic. So sit up straight, children, and I'll carry on. Truth is playing the music rather than the instrument. It's the player or singer extracting es essences by meaning every note. This eliminates idle imitation, it eliminates playing off muscle memory, and it eliminates the seductive trap of playing to impress. At the same time, it intensifies the beauty and deepens the emotions including that most courageous one of exposing vulnerability. Fundamentally, it is purging all the bullshit to which all artists can succumb if they are not on their guard against it. Some musicians never get it. They can spend whole careers trying to impress others or regurgitating the licks of their heroes. Truth is the difference between living it and pretending. It's not puritanical and it needn't be stark. It can be funny. It can be as big as Beethoven's Ninth or as theatrical as Warren Ellis, as raw as Hound Dog Taylor or as anguished as Janis Joplin, as lonely as Miles Davis or as soaring as Jonas Kaufman. Some have an intuitive truth compass from the start, like Billie Holiday, Muddy Waters, Amalia Rodriguez, and Arturo Toscanini. Others acquire it with maturity. In the heyday of Oz, you can be a little bit pregnant with truth. In the heyday of Oz pub rock, truth was partially present in the work of, say, Midnight Oil and, my, and um, Cold Chisel, but hard to spot in, say, My Sex or Ice House. Only musicians committed to propagating truth can come close to profundity. And profundity does not just mean Bach, Mahler, or Shostakovich. Profundity means the depth of a groove or the impact of a lyric. It means Elmore James singing Dust My Broom or Marisa singing Primavera. One of Jack's many wonders was the way he deepened grooves with his phrasing on bass and piccolo bass. The stop and start points of his lines combined with the harmonies to give the music a unique bounce. He once told me, there are certain parts of a rhythmic structure that have to have weight and others lightness and that will give movement. The music rolled rather than rocked and could be funkier than that of the African-Americans who had inspired him. There is no direct link between truth and technique, except in the negative sense of an excessive preoccupation with facility causing a divergence from the path of truth. Truly great artists who had an iron grip on truth, like Picasso, Samuel Beckett, and Paul Motion, actually stripped back their art as they grew older. Yet no one produces high art with having worked fiendishly hard to get to the point at which they make it. Of the hundreds of people I've interviewed over the last 36 years, Keith Jarrett was among the most fascinating. He is not just driven, he is completely obsessed. And Jack too was obsessive. For such people making music is not a game, however playful the end product itself might be. It defines their existence. While we can remember Jack's concerts and listen to his records to relish his singing, playing, composing, arranging and producing, there was another dimension to his artistry that was as significant as any and that directly spread truth to other players his band leading. A band leader dabbles in the black art of human chemistry. What might happen if this person were to make music with that person? It's a combination of talent spotting and leaps of the imagination. If the band leader gets it right, 
the musicians are presented with a field upon which to play that allows them to maximize their potential. They are not subservient to a vision. Rather, the vision is intrinsically one in which they fulfill themselves. Miles Davis may well have recoiled from being called a free improviser, yet he had a phase when composition became almost redundant because the composition of his band was the catalyst for music making, personalities striking sparks against each other. I've interviewed two dozen people who played with Miles, from Sonny Rollins to John Schofield, and however many years had passed and however important their current projects were to them, they were all only too happy to talk about that life-changing experience. Other great band leaders include the eternally underrated and misunderstood Sun Ra, who also knew that all music was one, and who kindled such extraordinary lo loyalty from monster musicians like John Gilmore and Marshall Allen that they barely had a profile outside of his orchestra. In the world of rock, collectivism and dictatorships are more common, although Frank Zappa, someone whom Jack loved, deserves an honourable mention. In the current century, the supreme example was Paul Motion. He gave players like Bill Frizzell, Joe Lovano and Chris Potter the confidence and freedom to be themselves and created contexts in which they had no choice. Truth surrounded them and to hide behind a mask, whether of technique, opaque emotion or anything else, was not an option. I've interviewed some 14 people who worked with Jack and patently he was blessed with this multi multiplicity of skills, empathies and insights. His talent spotting was uncanny and he too wanted nothing other than for the players to be themselves. To achieve specific musical results he could sometimes deploy the great director's knack of edging actors towards the desired outcome in a way that made them feel they had discovered it for themselves. Or they came to realize there was really only one truthful option anyway. A defining aspect of Jack as a band leader was that like Ray Charles, he brought an improviser's mentality to bear on music where improvisation was not necessarily the main focus. Some R&B leaders have been almost tyrannical and in James Brown's case, there was no almost. I've been lucky enough to hear the stories directly from Maceo Parker. The musical di dictator in Jack, however, wore a halo of collaboration and prized spontaneity. The work of such an artist is not just too beautiful to be lost, it is too important to be forgotten. Yet cultural amnesia is rife in Australia. While members of the Budget Orchestra keep Jack's legacy alive, the legacies of some of our other significant truth seekers are endangered. People like Bernie McGann, David Addis, Mark Simmons, and Phil Trelaw. Significant artists don't even have to die to fade from the collective memory. They can just semi-retire or leave our shores. If it is vaguely profitable, then revered Australian films from bygone years will be made available digitally. But what of classic LPs or classic out-of-print CDs? Are they just forgotten, regardless of quality or influence? It took a German label to re-release several classic Australian albums from the 60s recently. By the by, because these were out of copyright, the artists, who included Mike Nock and Judy Bailey, were not consulted. The CDs just appeared. On that issue, I could go as red in the face as Barnaby Joyce talking about anti-coal activists. So let's dwell on the other issue. Why did it take a German label to show an interest in this material? Why no local re-release? This label has a modest profile, and while some Germans might don't know Mike's work, few probably know Judy's. Yet it's the Germans who think these records are worthy of re-release rather than us. 
it seems that Philistinism, apathy, and cultural amnesia are dangerously close to completely taking over this place. As you know, the ABC uses 9994, Don Bradman's batting average, as its postcode. What equivalent celebrations of our artists do we find? Precious few. Many of our finest painters are represented in our major galleries, and the occasional one, a Brett Whiteley, a Margaret Ollie, or a John Olson, will gatecrash the consciousness of the wider public, though more for misbehavior, eccentricity, or living a long time than for their art. And of course, our actors who become international film stars are exalted, but more for their celebrity than their artistry. Sydney has a healthier theatre scene than music scene in terms of audience numbers, but certainly not in terms of artistry. The tireless John Wardle, who is here somewhere and who really people deserves a round of applause. John could give you a thesis on why audience numbers for live music hit a brick wall, but let's say the impact of noise laws, fire egress laws, and poker machines in pubs had a head-on collision with the advent of the internet, the commodification of music, and an obsession with social media and gadgetry rather than real-life experiences, like you're going to get tonight. Among the myriad reasons why this was a tragedy is the fact that, as I've said, live music engenders a sense of community as opposed to us merely being a collection of disparate and rather desperate economic units. Now we find ourselves in the unholy era of Trump when a lie is heralded as truth and truth is maligned as a lie. So how should artists respond? Should they cocoon themselves from the putrid horror of it all, or do they in fact have a role? I believe they do as any member of the community does. Perhaps just as beauty begets beauty, truth begets truth. If the artist is rigorous and relentless in the pursuit of truths both big and small, Perhaps he or she helps the community to inure itself against falsehood. If that sounds far-fetched, what is there to lose? At the worst, the artist is enhancing his or her art. At best, you help people feel their way towards veracity through this fog of falsehood, and you're neither thickening the fog nor polluting your art. I don't subscribe to the myth that one needs to be impoverished to make good art, but one must inevitably overcome obstacles of one sort or another. And among them is this ultimate battle, where truth wins out and spawns beauty. It's this that decides if the art in question has lasting value as well as short-term appeal. Truth is not just an imperative for players. It is an imperative for listeners and for critics. Far from being merely a political movement with affiliated ideologies, populism is part of a broader movement of democratization spawned by the internet. In theory, this democratization sounds like a wonderful development. In practice, the ability of search engines to give equal weight to falsehoods as to truths is disastrous. It is this excessive democratization that allows someone to say that their opinion counts for as much as a doctor's when debating the efficacy of vaccination. It allows another person to claim their opinion is more valid than a scientist's when discussing the anthropological impact on climate change. And of course, it has changed the face of everything from restaurant and wine reviews to arts criticism. Some might claim that this development has rendered the role of the professional critic redundant. I agree. No, just joking. <laughs> but of course, we critics are an endangered species, 
and our, extinct our extinction here in Sydney right now is looking quite imminent. What does that have to do with truth and music? I guess it relates to the, it, it, it has to do with the um, related issue of truth and reviewing. When you read a blogger's glowing concert review, how do you know it wasn't penned by the artist's mum? If a regular theatre blogger talks a theatre company into coughing up free tickets, to what extent does the blogger compromise his or her views in order to continue to receive those tickets? Truly independent critics should avoid having their perspectives clouded, not just by conflicts of interest, but by other opinions. Like most people, I suffer from self-doubt. Well, most people other than Donald Trump. And I despair over bad writing from me or anyone else. I fear that when the professional critic is extinct, much of what is left will be misspelt, cliche-ridden, and plodding. But apparently, we can't turn back the tide. I began writing reviews in the wake of my Lester Bowie article being published for the princely sum of $40. In 1993, the Herald offered me work sharing the jazz reviewing with Peter Jordan. I was down to about $15 in the bank at the time, so it wasn't a long conversation. I swiftly learned that the media are besotted with the concept of the expert. As someone who refutes the reality of genres, I battled against being just a jazz critic and edged my way into reviewing everything from television shows to Baroque opera, theater to Patti Smith, musicals to Buddy Guy, and Weimar-style cabaret to Rokia Traore. Yet, Last year, I found myself sitting next to the then editor-in-chief at a Sydney Theatre Sydney Company production I was reviewing, and we introduced ourselves, and he said something like, oh, yeah, the jazz guy. <laughs> Typecasting is not just the bane of actors and musicians. It does few favours for truth or the idea that all music is one. So let's return to the hypothesis that truth begets not only beauty, but more truth. In this cartoonish, post-truth, Trumpian world of alternative facts, we are, as I said, ever more obliged to spread truth as the best way to slap down this insidiousness. Even a single line of honest, heartfelt melody may play a part because it in turn confirms to the listener the beauty and value of emotional truth and improves their ability to take bullshit. No performer should ever succumb to propagating those fake emotions so highly prized on Eurovision. You know the sort of thing where the singer screws up his or her face and hits some shrieking high note that is supposed to speak of inner anguish, but that really just speaks of vulgarity. A discussion of the outer limits of human capabilities might turn to those who make myriad decisions per microsecond while doing something that requires supreme physical skill and may put the body and mind under some stress. Jet fighter pilots and Formula One drivers are examples. Hang on. Myriad decisions per microsecond, supreme physical skill, body and mind under some stress, sound familiar? The thing that fighter pilots don't have to incorporate is heart. Emotion is the native enemy of analytical decision making, but music's greatest friend. So when you add heart to physical dexterity and instinct-driven speed of light decision-making, I would suggest that of all the skills humanity has mastered, the most astonishing of all is making music. Making it collectively is more remarkable and perhaps making do improvising is greater still, as long as it's truthful. I love the band you are about to hear, as I do this event. 
in a country that suffers from severe cultural amnesia and in a world where truth is under grave threat, this event keeps alive the legacy of a superlative artist who understood all music was one and who only knew one way to sing and play, honestly. I thank Frankie, Brendan and John for entrusting me with the flame of Jack's legacy for half an hour and we should all applaud them for their work in organising tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John Shan. That was fabulous. I'm going to seek out the uh, podcast of that and listen to it later. And because uh, it was some very com complex things in there, but I enjoyed the mellifluity of your voice. <laughs> I love the language. Um, <laughs> where else do you get to use mellifluity? You know, I haven't used that for months. Um, so, <laughs> so um, we proceed. So the next thing we have to do is to announce the winner of the Jackie Ozarski Composition Contest. This is a, a contest that was open to APRA members to write a song or instrumental piece inspired by the music ideas, life and personality of the late Jackie Ozarski. Not a simple thing in some ways. Um, and to present the award, please welcome bass player extraordinaire and alumnus of the University of Jack Yorzarski, Dave Symes. G'day, everybody. Well, first of all, on behalf of the Orzarski Budget Orchestra, I want to thank you all for making this happen, everybody that's put it together to bring back Jack's music and all he believed in. I was really lucky as a young guy to uh, to get the chance to work with Jack and also all of these people here are kind of like my extended family and they, they brought me up into this musical world. So this is a pretty special night again for me and I can't wait to get up here and, and have a hit with them. So once again, thanks to everybody for putting it on. Thanks to the Budget Orchestra. It's going to be Marty. We do have a competition and the competition is the, to sort of celebrate all the different kind of styles of music that Jack was influenced by and also a lot of the music that he influenced others with and encourages people to write instrumental music, songs, combination. And so um, on behalf of APRA and AMCOS, who have made this award possible, I would like to announce the winner. With a song title of Who We Got Left, it goes to the fabulous Mr. Tim Koenig. <laughs> Brother Tim. Mr. Tim Koenig. Oh, thanks. Um, it's a bit weird just to come up here and get some flowers from Symsey, who... It, <laughs> in uh, 19... At the first Erskineville Music Festival, I went and found Dave after he'd played with Jack as a 17-year-old and sort of... Oh, you forgot your lead, Dave, that he left at the Rose. Where I'd been, where I'd been the voluntary stage manager. Um, anyway, I just wanted to say uh, I wrote this song because I thought Jack would really hate the state of Sydney at the moment, and he'd fucking tell you about it <laughs> at the townie at 4 a.m. Um, so I just wanted to say this song was for Jack, and I also wanted to thank uh, his band who I got to work with a bit and uh, who I still work with. And I think his influence just has really made us better people and musicians. 
Uh, and just wanted to say, thank um, uh, the vocalist who sung on the track, Lana Sayer, Josh Beagley, who played the guitar, and Mikey Raper, who played some trombone. Um, I'd like to thank APRA AMCOS for putting on this event, which I think is great. And also uh, to John and Frankie and Brendo for getting together and making this happen. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Nice one, Tim. Uh, thanks, everybody. That's my gig over. I can have a drink now and say hi. Um, we've got to do a little bit of rearranging because uh, I think people are going to want to get down and be funky. Um, so up next will be Tina and all the crew with the Jackie Ozarski Band. Thank you very much.